I was born in Vienna in 1929 and I had wonderful parents, but my poor mother got sick when I was about three or four years old, so I don't remember too much, but I know I adored her. And when I was six years old, she died of breast cancer. She was so wonderful. She painted beautiful pictures, which I have one here, and she could make clothes. She, could, she had gift golden hands, and she was wonderful. And she wrote me a letter when she was dying, which brings tears to my eyes. It's in German, of course. And she wrote, you're the, the thing I love most in this world. But I was very young at that time. But I had that letter somewhere now. And my grandmother came to live with us, my father and my grandmother. And after a while, I went to live with my aunt, who was in Vienna too, and uncle. And they came to New York long before I did. I mean, they got away, they had papers. And in 1938, Hitler marched into Vienna and took over the country. I actually saw Hitler in person when I was in Vienna. When he marched in, when the German troops marched into Vienna, which was the capital of Austria, he, there was a big fancy hotel and Hitler made a speech on the balcony to thousands of people, and I was in that square watching him speak. He yelled, he didn't speak, he always yelled. That was in the very beginning when he wasn't after the Jews. This was in the very beginning when they marched into Austria. That was the first country they took. After that came Poland and Czechoslovakia and Holland. They took all the European countries and the people became Nazis because it was great for the economy. Like in Germany, it was very, they were very poor. The whole Germany economy was terrible. But when he came into power, he promised them affluence and, and it worked because he put everyone into the army and he, you know, worked, they made munitions, because his dream was to take over Germany, über alles, that means Germany over the whole world. That was their motto, Deutschland über alles, Germany over everything. <laughs> so in the beginning, it didn't sound so terrible until we heard Goebbels and Goering were two of his generals, and they were Jew haters, and they got him, or I think he was already a Jew hater, and they said we would be better with an all Aryan race, meaning Christian, get rid of the Jews, take all their possessions, and then they came to what they called the final answer, to kill all the Jews and just keep all their things, and, and they became wealthy, the Germans, through the annihilating the Jews they became, and overtaking all these countries. And of course, there was a big hatred of Jews and no Jews were safe. You weren't allowed to go into stores or to sit on benches or to use the bus. Eventually, they burnt anyone who had a business. They burnt it out and they invaded people's homes, took everything they wanted. And then they came up with the idea of concentration camps. I know I got beaten up by, chil by children in school because I was Jewish. They followed me home and beat me up. I mean, it was not safe. It made me scared to go to school, but I did. I mean, did after a while, it? Jewish children couldn't go to school at all. They closed up all Jewish establishments. You had to wear a big yellow uh, star, uh, a Jewish star on your arm, so everyone knew. My father lost his business, and there was one night called Kristallnacht where they burnt and crashed into everybody's business, or if you were Jewish, or the homes, and whoever could left the country. Yeah. Kristallnacht means that they broke, the crystal is glass, and they broke all the store windows that were Jewish, and that's why it was called Crystal Night, Kristallnacht. Night but that, that, did, that didn't affect me. When my father and grandmother realized that they wouldn't be able to save me because they couldn't save themselves, so they put me on a list to go to England. They were in touch with a family in Birmingham, England, who agreed to keep me until I'm 18. But when it came to the children transport, to save the children, 
I was on like one of the last ones that were allowed across the border. After mine, the next transport, all the children were shot. I was on the last one that got through. I was nine years old. They took me to the train station where this train was full of children, Jewish children. I wasn't old enough to grasp the meaning of that I would never see them again. No, nobody's told me that. A child, you don't tell a child you'll never see your father again. Later, my father was taken to concentration camp. My grandmother left for Czechoslovakia, but it didn't help her because he came there too. He came to all the countries and all the Jews were either killed or gassed or tortured. And all my girlfriends who were Jewish, nobody survived. No, so I mean, I'm an only survivor of not only my family. My grandmother had 16 siblings. Nobody lived, nobody survived. My father, my grand grandparents on his side and on my side. Once the Red Cross contacted my father in concentration camp and that was the last message that I got. He wrote to me and I got that. I'm doing all right, but of course he wasn't. I mean, but I know everyone was killed, everyone. Whether in the gas chamber or by torture, I don't know how. But as I said, being a young child, you don't feel it like if I would have been an adult. It would have been, as a child, you don't grasp what's happening. My mother was gone anyway, dead already, so. But no one survived, no one. I was with a lot of children, nobody who I knew, and there were people from committees, Jewish committees, who were overseeing this whole operation. First we went from Vienna, the train ride. I don't remember too much of the actual train ride, but I know we went to Holland, to the port, to cross the channel. The English channel, you know, you had to get to Holland and the, the, the ship. Uh, there was a ship somehow in Holland, and we ended up in in London, uh, Liverpool probably, and from there to London. We were all seasick, <laughs> crossing the channel. The ages were all ages. I was one of the youngest, and there was a girl in my bunk on the ship or train or whatever, and she was like 17, 18, and she was also bound for London. So she sort of took me under her wing. And in London, a very nice man who had volunteered took me and put me on the train for Birmingham, where I was, which was my final destination. But most children were staying in London, in hostels. They didn't have families to go to, they stayed in hostels. I was very lucky. Thank God I was young enough, I was young enough not to know the implication of what was happening. And I never heard from anyone anymore. And uh, when I got to Birmingham, I met the family I was to live with. And sadly, I did not take too much to the, they were people without children, a married couple with a lot of single sisters. The woman who was married had a lot of, and they all lived in that house. And I mean, they were very good to me, but, they didn't know how to handle a child. I wasn't allowed to bring children home from school. I wasn't allowed to sit on certain chairs, you know. It wasn't home, home, you know, but they saved my life. They spoke not a word of German and I didn't speak a word of English, but in two weeks I mastered English because when you're a child you learn very fast. And they put me in school and I was the best student in no time because the English were not so, I, you know, I don't know. I, I did very well in school in England. I learned because I didn't hear any more German at all, so I learned English. I had to. I never heard anyone around me speak German anymore. Whereas people who came over with their families, they still spoke German within the, and it took them much longer to learn English. School was wonderful, I made a lot of friends, but as I said, the, the lady of the house was very house proud. You weren't allowed in certain rooms, you weren't allowed, I wasn't allowed to use the upstairs bathroom. I had to go out in the garden. They had a, what you call an outhouse, a toilet. They were not 
it wasn't Catholic or any, it was called Christadelphians, their religion, a very unusual, and they saved thousands of Jewish children. It was their mission to save that particular religion was very much for the Jews. They helped, they, thousands of children were saved that way. These people went every Sunday to church, but they were very nice and they said to me, you have to do something. You either come with us to church or we'll send you to a synagogue, which was way across town. It would have been like a two hour journey or hour and a half. And so of course I wouldn't do that alone, even though they would have taken me the first time. I, I had no people, I didn't know anybody there. So I went to church quite a while. Often I didn't go, but uh, on Sunday sometimes I went with them to church. It was not Catholic, it was not a religious type of, and they had many Jewish children there because they had, like me, they had saved a lot of children. But the thing is that in 1940 the bombing began. The, G the Germans bombed England and we had to dig holes in the garden and you put, you, it was mandatory to build a shelter with corrugated iron and you put down a carpet on the ground, on the dirt and you took benches and you went every night when it got dark, you went down there for the night, you took along what you needed because the bombing would start any time, the sirens would go off and I used to shiver because we were living near a munitions factory and that was a target of those planes, you know, the munitions. Walking distance, yes. And so they were targeting that particular area of Birmingham, which was central England, and they did the munitions. I remember every night we would sit in this shelter and when we heard the drone of planes starting, when they started to come over, you hear the engines of the planes and we would shiver. And first it was incendiary bombs, which is fire bombs. We were surrounded by fire many nights. And then one night we came out of the shelter in the morning and our house was gone, flat. We were in the garden, in the dirt, in the ground, and we were saved, we got a house. They had friends through the church that moved us to the suburb on the outskirts of Birmingham. But we were there near an airport, and that again was a, a target. But luckily that house remained standing. You didn't know what was happening. The noises, the bombs going off, and the, they had whistling bombs. They were and you knew they were targeting. You didn't know what was happening, really. You were scared to look. But nobody was hurt of our family. And I still loved the school that I had been in before, in the original. And so every day I took a long trip with a bus, two buses, to, because I wanted still to be with my friends that I had made in the first school. Mm. And in England, you didn't go to high school unless you had a special... High school was like college. Your schooling was finished at age 14, and if you had a scholarship or, you know, you were really very smart, you went on to college. And I got a free scholarship to, uh, through my art. I was artistic. And through my art, I got a free scholarship for an art college. So the principal of that school contacted the people I lived with, but they were ignorant, not at all. You know, they didn't think about education or anything. They said, no, she's going to go to work when she's 14. So when I was at the end of 13, I went to an office to work, but that was fine. I just missed out on college, which would have been free, and they were not college, they were not educated, you know. So they didn't say, no, you're going to go to work, you don't go to college. So I went to work and it was a pleasant, you know, it was a, I was a clerk in an office and I made a lot of friends there. But there was a lot of traveling from where I lived on the outskirts and I had to travel into the city, you know, commute. So I adapted very well. And, uh, but then I got something that I had to go to a hospital. It wasn't terrible, but that time they kept you months in the hospital for nothing. Okay. I had a small surgery on my back. It was nothing much, but they kept me and that way. I lost that job and then I went to another job. Very interesting. The assay office, they tested silver. You know, silver has to have a stamp 
and it was an assay office meeting. They tested this very famous company. I was in touch with my aunt who had gone to New York from Vienna, the one I had lived with who I adored. In Vienna, or in all the occupied countries, the Jews went on a list. They got, you registered, you got a number. And according to what number you were, the people who registered first got their number was called first to get out. But my father owned a factory, a business, and he felt, oh, it's going to blow over. You know, politics, it's going to, it'll be all right. So he didn't register till it was too late. But my uncle and aunt had registered early because he didn't have a business or anything to lose. So they, their number was called and they tried to take me with them, but they wouldn't allow it because I was with, on the papers with my father, which was never came up, that number never came up. So my aunt and uncle used to send packages as much as they could to the family in England. It was difficult, you know, during the war to send anything. I mean, they were very anxious, you know, my aunt was my mother's sister. And she was very anxious to have me the president of the United States at that time was Roosevelt. And he wasn't against Jews, but he would only allow a certain amount because of the economy. If he allowed all the Jews in to take the jobs, it would have been bad for the Americans. So he only allowed a certain number of people. Each country over here, they took a few Jews, but not so many because there was that famous ship even that was turned back. No country would accept them because they didn't want all these Jews taking good jobs. They were all, the Jews were mostly very educated. They were doctors and scientists and they didn't want, you know, them to get all the good, whatever, I don't know. I'm not political. And one day I got a telephone call at work from my family that my aunt had gotten me a ticket to come to New York. So I left, then and there I left the job, went home and packed my stuff, whatever I had. And I went to London in order to get to New York. I came to New York when I was 17. I arrived March the 1st, 1947. And my aunt met me, it was a terrible snowstorm that day in New York, deep snow. She and her nephew came to the ship, the docks along New York, but they, it was very difficult because the snow was very high. But anyway, I, I adored coming back to my aunt and I lived with her, I got a job through a relative of hers. I got a nice job until I could, until I met my husband, which was at the tea dance called Cafe Vienna, where all refugee people like me met one another. And I met my husband, we danced, he asked me to dance. He took my phone number, turned out he lived in my neighborhood because this was downtown in the city. And we got engaged and I got married when I was 19. And he was also from Germany, and his, but he came with his parents. And he had been in the United, Arm, United States Army because he was seven years older than me. So he had been in the army and that's how I became a citizen, through him being a citizen. When you go in the army, you become a citizen. And his unit were at Berchtesgaden, and I have a photograph somewhere where he's standing on Hitler's balcony of his home, holding the swastika flag, showing he's a Ger an American soldier, and we took over Hitler's castle or whatever it was. And then the story came out that they were in bunkers and he had this girlfriend, Hitler. Her name was Eva Brown, was Hitler's girlfriend. But they died together in this bunker. They heard the American planes coming, the Allied planes, and they knew it was the end. They overtook Berlin. This was the, Hitler was in Berlin, capital of Germany. And they, they killed themselves in that bunker. We spoke English. I mean, we both spoke German. He spoke German to his parents who never learned English. You know, they never adapted to English. But we spoke only English and at home too, which is a pity. If we had spoken German in the house, our children would have learned your mother. My children would have learned German automatically. But 
it, I was more comfortable with English at that time because I hadn't spoken German for many years. I was eight years in England, so I didn't speak German for eight years. He came with his parents. He lived, he came from Germany, not Vienna. Leipzig, the city was Leipzig. And he was an apprentice in a fur shop in, in Leipzig. And he became a furrier. He got his own business when I met him. He was seven years older than me, so he was already established. He had a small fur in the first center in New York, down on 27th Street. And uh, he, wasn't, he was quite well off. I mean, he, we managed, like I said, to buy a convertible on our honeymoon. And we waited six years to have children. But that was by choice because all my friends suddenly got pregnant and so I decided it's time. And so I had two children, two girls, your mother and Aunt Ruth. Being a mother, wonderful, wonderful. I had two beautiful babies and my husband adored the, the children. But sadly he smoked like a chain smoker and that got him at an early age. Well, Ruthie, when she was in college, there's a very famous man called Eli Wiesel. Maybe you heard of him. That was Ruthie's, at that time he wasn't so famous. He was a professor at City College and Ruthie was in City College and she took a course on the Holocaust, which Eli Wiesel, who was from Europe, was teaching. So he was her professor and she learned about everything in college. I've been many times back to Europe, but I avoided Vienna. I avoided it because I figured it would give me terrible memories of my grandmother and everyone. Mm -hmm. So I did want to. I didn't want to go to Vienna, but my my niece Eleanor, who you know, they took a trip to Vienna, and they went to the Jewish cemetery, and I figured they desecrated, but my mother's grave is still there. It's still, and they took a picture of her grave, and she died in 1936. So that, her grave is still standing, but I could never get myself to go to Vienna. I would see the house I lived in, and my parents, and my grandparents, and I just didn't want those memories. I went to Israel, and there's the big famous Holocaust Museum, and different departments. One is so pathetic. You go through in darkness in a tunnel in this Holocaust Museum and you hear the voices of the Jewish children crying, crying for their parents, crying, probably from concentration. It, it was a terrible experience. You walked through the dark and you heard, and they mentioned every few minutes they called out a name of a Jewish child that perished. So you heard constantly the names of children who died, my friends being amongst them, but I never heard particularly their name. But it was very emotional. Can Have you, you seen Schindler's I List? So can you explain it's, it only depicts the least of the worst. It, it has some bad scenes where they shoot the Jews, they had to dig their own graves, then they stand there, they're shot in the back and they just throw them in the grave. But that's the worst. I mean, that Schindler was a, not Jewish, a great person. He gave jobs to Jews from concentration camps which saved their lives. And he, he's, he's, he's actually buried in Israel, although he's a German. And he tried to save many Jews. So that showed that Schindler's List. But it doesn't show what terrible things the Nazis did. They exped did human experiments on children. You know, they used them. They, made, they took people's skin and made lamps out of them. They, they, they did dreadful things. Then they killed them anyway. My father-in-law had a sister, Aunt Senia, maybe you've heard of her. She was actually in concentration camp the whole war. She had never met. As a young woman, she was caring for her mother because she was the oldest and still home, not married. Then Hitler came to Russia where she lived and she took care of her mother and they were put she, she told the story of how she was sent to Auschwitz, the worst camp, and you stood in a line and the German soldiers would say, 
if they thought you could work, you were able-bodied and young enough, go to the right, you get a job. And if those like were old or sick, or go to the left, you knew you were going to a gas chamber, you know. But she somehow survived because she was still young enough and she worked, you know, munitions and stuff from, con she was in concentration camp, but every day sent to work. They weren't tortured, they, were, they weren't given much to eat, but they worked for the Nazis to save their lives. Oh God, there was a trial, you know, in Nuremberg, the trials, of, I don't know if you saw that movie, the trials of Nuremberg, and every big famous uh, Nazi who was called up and put on trial, they all said we were only following orders. You know, a lot of them escaped to South America, Nazis, the big Nazis. They got jobs. They're still hunting them now. Some are still alive. They must be very old by now. But they all, you know, their excuse was we had to follow orders, and that's baloney. They took great pleasure in it because they got rich on that, you know. So that's my life story. <laughs>